Hear these words from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to be married to a man descended from David. The man's name was Joseph, and the virgin's name, Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her, Good morning, you're beautiful with God's beauty, beautiful inside and out. God be with you. Mary was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great and called son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will rule Jacob's house forever. No end ever to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, but how? I've, I've never slept with a man. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the highest hover over you. Therefore, the child you bring to birth will be called Holy, Son of God. And did you know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son, old as she is? Everyone called her barren, and here she is, six months pregnant. Nothing, you see, is impossible with God. And Mary said, yes, I see it all now. I'm the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me just as you say. Then the angel left her. Mary consents, pregnant with the end of this age and the hope for the coming one. This is the word of God for all God's people. Thanks be to God. The story of Mary's choice, the Annunciation, is one of the most familiar stories in the New Testament. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, as we just heard. The angel greets Mary, calling her God's favored one, and he describes the divine plan for a miraculous conception. Mary expresses doubt. Gabriel explains God's plan in greater detail. Mary consents, and the angel departs. But there is so much more to the story than this, even in the moment, her moment. I remember standing in a live tableau of the manger scene in junior high, representing Mary in a light blue gown with a white headscarf. It was one of half a dozen still life reenactments that visually conveyed the nativity story staged on the chancel in the very large church my family attended at that time. In my growing up with the story, Mary was portrayed as this soft-spoken, submissive, meek woman in blue. Nothing about her decision to say yes to God was discussed in the context of what it must have cost her, or if it was, I certainly didn't remember it then. The story that was captured in that tableau I stood in was so familiar that her obedience to God seemed almost easy, taken for granted as part of a greater story. Yet her decision is one of the pivotal moments upon which our Christian faith is based. There wasn't really anything special about Mary that we know of. Nothing to mark her as particularly worthy of God's notice or favor. To our knowledge, she was an ordinary young girl about to be married to a mere carpenter living in a small town in a backwater province until her encounter with the angel Gabriel. Until then, nothing about her life suggested that she would play an integral role in God's plan for us. In that sense, Mary's very ordinariness is encouraging. Luke's gospel is distinct in its insistence that God invites ordinary people to extraordinary things. Few people can live up to an ideal, but everyone can make a choice and has the freedom to make a choice. This young girl, Mary, who says, yes, fearlessly announced the arrival of God's kingdom to earth, Mary's courage and her response to God's call opened her life to something utterly illumined by God's grace. We can recognize that all these centuries later, reading about her life. 
But Mary's story also invites us to see and choose that same life of illumination for ourselves. We know that Mary was much perplexed by Gabriel's words, that she pondered his greeting. And we know from her question, how can this be since I am a virgin, that she recognized the, well, bizarre nature of the angel's announcement, certainly even more so in the day. And she doesn't leap headlong into obedience. She wonders and ponders and questions and considers. She surely knew all that was at stake in her freedom to accept or refuse the angel. Historic tradition tells us that Mary was probably 13 or 14 years old when the angel appeared to her. And we know that in first century Jewish culture, a girl who became pregnant out of wedlock faced grave danger. At the very least, she became an object of widespread scorn, and at worst, she risked being stoned to death by the very villagers who had helped to raise her. So to consent, to say yes in this instance, was to give herself over to scandal and ostracism. It was to put everything, her reputation, her marriage, her life, on the line. And we know from her last words to the angel that she did. She agreed to God's plan. So much so that a few verses later, she will testify to the God she's always known with the Magnificat, the opening verses to today's service. Singing of the God who shows mercy for those who fear God, who scatters the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, who brings down the powerful from their thrones and lifts up the lowly, who fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich away empty, who remembers Abraham and all of his descendants, which now include her and us forever. She knows what her God has done for her, for her cousin Elizabeth, for the outcast, the overlooked, and those discarded, disenfranchised, or dismissed. She sings of God's grace, but God's plan for her was a strange kind of blessing. Gabriel greets her as highly favored, but by our standards at least, her life is anything but. None of what we often associate with grace or favor, wealth or health or comfort or ease, really came her way. Instead, she faced shame, dishonor, public disgrace as she bore a child out of wedlock. As a child, Simeon warns her that Jesus will bring judgment and division, and a sword will pierce her own soul too, that she will also know that pain of rejection and division. She will be forced to flee her home and live as a refugee. She bears the gossip and stigma of speculations about Jesus' mental sanity as he begins his ministry. And ultimately, she will see her son executed as a criminal. So it's clearly no benign thing to be favored of God. So why say yes? Mary's favored status led her straight from scandal to danger to the trauma of her son's crucifixion. God's call required her to trust an inner vision that flew in the face of everything her community expected of her or what she saw for herself. As the years passed and her son's enemies multiplied, Mary's yes demanded a degree of courage that makes me tremble as a mother of a son. And over and over again, we, seen that, we see that same courage that marked her first yes as she steadfastly faces all of that, all that Simeon warned her of, disruption, discouragement, the loss of her son in one of the cruelest ways imaginable. And yet she trusts in God's promise, all in. Her obedience stems from that trust, and her blessing came from the fellowship shared with God as a partner in God's mission of redemption and transformation for the world. Denise Levertov writes a poem prose uh, reflection on the Annunciation that shifts this just a little bit. She begins saying this, we know the scene, 
The room, variously furnished, almost always a lectern, a book, and always the tall lily, the tableau, if you will. Arrived on solemn grandeur of great wings, the angelic ambassador standing or hovering, whom she acknowledges, a guest in the room. We are told of her meek obedience. No one mentions courage. The engendering spirit did not enter her without consent. God waited. She was free to accept or to refuse, her choice integral to her humanness. And I wonder, aren't there enunciations of one or sort, one sort or another in most lives? Where some unwillingly undertake great destinies and enact them in sullen pride, uncomprehending? Or more often those moments when roads of light and storm open from a darkness in a man and a woman and are turned away from in dread, in a wave of weakness, in despair, and sometimes with relief so that ordinary lives can continue. God does not smite them for their choices, but the gates close and the pathway vanishes. Mary had been a child who played, ate, and slept like any other child, but unlike others, wept only for pity and laughed in joy, not triumph. Compassion and intelligence fused in her, indivisible. Called to a destiny more momentous than any in all of time, she did not quail, only asked a simple, how can this be? And gravely, courteously took to heart the angel's reply and the astounding ministry she was offered to bear in her womb infinite weight and lightness to carry in hidden, finite inwardness nine months of eternity, to contain in a slender vase of being the sum of power in narrow flesh, the sum of light, and then to bring to birth, push out into the air, a man-child needing like any other, milk and love, but who was God. This was the moment that no one speaks of, which she could still refuse. A breath unbreathed, spirit suspended, and waiting. She did not cry, I cannot, I am not worthy, nor I have not the strength. She did not submit with gritted teeth, raging, coerced. Bravest of all humans, consent illumined her. The room filled with its light. The lily, glow, lily glowed in it and the iridescent wings. Consent, courage unparalleled, opened her utterly. This week's readings end with, Then the angel departed from her. His departure with the decision made is the moment when prayer ends, that vision recedes and certainty wavers. It's the moment after the yes, the moment when the mountaintop experience fades into memory and life in the valley begins. As we make our way once more in the valley amongst the shepherds and kings towards Bethlehem, we rejoice that through the birth of this tiny helpless child in Mary's arms, God makes the common holy, the mundane mighty, and the everyday, extraordinary. We anticipate with wonder this babe, this gift of hope and peace, joy and love. We honor the eve of Christ's birth based on the impact of one angel on one young girl whose yes to God changed the world, as do our yeses each time we respond as Mary did. Here am I, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Amen and amen.